they're being led of you to continue working in your vineyard. I just pray, Lord, that you will continue to be with them as a family. You know the children are sick this evening. May you put your hand upon their bodies and just minister to them in a very special way. Continue to meet the needs of this family so that they can get back to the DR and continue to serve you uh, among your children through the churches there. We thank you for what you're doing, and Lord, we thank you for Dan and Barb and the kids there, and we just pray that you will continue to use them in this same aspect of the ministry there and be with the local churches, that they might cooperate in everything and learn from these, your servants, and uh, Lord, that you will give them much fruit for their labor. Lord, we love you because you first loved us. Amen. And we just pray, Lord, again, that you'll continue to guide and direct in the ministry that's yours in the Dominican Republic. Amen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 God bless you. Good to see you. Yes, sir. God bless you. We'll be in touch. Thanks for being with us tonight. And uh, continue to pray for them. Now, I'm going to invite Ron Langhofer to come now and share with us our missionary uh, moment tonight uh, for our missionary of the week that we have to pray for. Mr. Ron, when are you going to the Dominican Republic? I was just thinking that some of the men who went down to Ecuador was trained in dental work. Uh, yeah. So we could send some fellows down. Yeah, yeah, that's right. We did some dental work. Yes, we did. I pulled three teeth and filled two and did. What was? It? And you did? Oh, what? Oh, okay. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not to say that. He said, "Shh." What'd you do? Give us an update. I do very little but pray for these these missionaries, and I try to make it a priority as we keep in. In touch with him and it's this week as we pray for Josh Brown uh, it's been many years even though he's a young man many years that we prayed for Josh as his family were missionaries to England at one time and now he's serving with uh, missionaries international on not only learning to fly planes but all that's involved in that and repair work of them uh, the email we got this week that he'll be leaving tomorrow for Lebanon, Tennessee, to continue some classes for his testing on power plants and other repair work on the planes. But uh, he asked us to pray also for the wisdom of where he will go next to further his training. Uh, he asked us to pray that the Lord would control the weather to where he could get his flights in so that he could become a full-time pilot. So as we do, and you know, it is such a a blessing to have the Woodrings here with us tonight, of uh, missionaries, uh, with Johnny, with Elwood, with Kevin and Trina. You know, it, it makes my heart do good to see this many missionaries who have turned their lives over to the Lord. And uh, let me just throw a commercial in for our missions conference that's up and coming for whosoever shall hear and all over the world, there's those that need the Lord. And you know, we have some choice people with us even at this evening who have given their lives and uh, makes us sort of wonder what keeps us in our pews. There's a calling out there. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. And Father, we, we do come before you this evening and the missionary of the week is, yeah, I wanna say Mr. Brown, but you know, he's just, he just joshed us. That, We've known him since he was a, a little fellow. You've used his family to, to lead others to, to your son. And Father, now as he's grown, he, he hears and knows the calling that those missionaries must arrive at different places for different reasons. And Father, he has asked you and you have given him the opportunity to, to fly planes, to get missionaries in and out of places where now, charters wouldn't be able to go. Father, well, in the nick of time, then he might have to go to snatch a missionary out of a trouble spot, whether it be weather or an accident. But Father, he is, he is traveling tomorrow. I pray that 
As your word tells us in James, if we ask for wisdom, that you will give it liberally. And Father, on behalf of Josh tonight, that I ask that you would clear his mind, that he would soak up every need and every opportunity he has to, to learn what you have for him. Then, Father, his next prayer was, where would you like him to go? Father, I pray that you would give him clarity and directions on where the further is schooling at. And Father, and where to be a minister of your gospel. Father, you would open up the doors that he may go through. And Father, for those in our, in our midst tonight, those who have accepted that call to go where you would send them, Father, we, we thank you. We give all praise unto you. And Father, as even John Brank out tonight, let it be that we are people who, who do decrease in order that you may increase. And we'll give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we invite you all to take your hymn books now and turn to number 287, a song that we sing around our mission conference uh, quite often till the whole world knows. By the way, Johnny Rodriguez, that's a very popular baseball name. Every team that comes into Pittsburgh has a Rod Rodriguez. So all your cousins must be play baseball. You play baseball? I do. Do, what position? I was a left fielder. Left fielder, all right. Yeah, the Pirates traded one of their utility men to Philadelphia. So you might check with the Pirates. Maybe you can sign on there for the spring training. <laughs> All right, 287, till the whole world knows, as the organ begins to play, let's stand and sing it out. Chorus, all right? Verse number two.
H and H. Hunter Heaton. <clears throat> Up to the hill of Calvary, my Savior went courageously, and there he bled and died for me. Hallelujah for the cross. And on that day the world was changed, a final perfect lamb was slain. Let earth and heaven now proclaim Hallelujah for the cross Hallelujah for the war he fought Love has won, death has lost Hallelujah for the souls he bought Hallelujah for the cross What good I've done could never save My debt too great for deeds to pay But God my Savior made a way Hallelujah for the cross A slave to sin my life was bound But all my chains fell to the ground when Jesus' blood came flowing down, hallelujah for the cross, hallelujah for the war he fought, love has won, death has lost, hallelujah for the souls he bought, hallelujah for the cross, and when I my final breath I'll have no need to fear the rest This hope will guide me into death Hallelujah for the cross Hallelujah for the war he fought Love has won, death has lost Hallelujah for the souls he bought Hallelujah for the cross Hallelujah for the cross Hallelujah for the cross Hallelujah for the cross, Hallelujah for the cross. Amen. Senator Heaton and um, that was the theme song for us out at the men's retreat this week. Hallelujah for the cross. And Pastor Barry Yingling led us in that. And uh, we had a, what a great time. And uh, so thank you for sharing it with us tonight, Hunter. Appreciate that very, very much. But I think it's very appropriate that we have John with us tonight. Because as you know, we are in a series on the Great Commission. Our theme is simply entitled, Reviewing the Great Commission. Obviously, we all know what it is, but sometimes it's important for us to look at it again. Dr. Al Smith used to say in reference to some of the songs that uh, we sing, he would say, sing them again for the first time. And, uh, you know, we know the Great Commission, uh, particularly if you've been brought up in a good, solid Bible-believing church, you've heard the Great Commission preached a lot. You've heard it over this pulpit through our missionaries as, as well as in other opportunities. But it's one of those subjects that we all need to keep before us. And so we're going to continue looking at this uh, context or this concept tonight, reviewing the Great Commission. And what I want to do again tonight as we begin the message is to read with you where the Great Commission is rendered to us in the Gospels and in the book of the Acts. Because the more we read the Scripture, the more it really becomes a part of our lives. And the more it becomes a part of our lives, the more we have the opportunity to know it and obey it 
and put it to use in our lives. So we're going to look at Matthew 28, 18 to 20, Mark 16, 15, Luke 24, 45 to 49, John 20, 21 and, uh, through 23, and Acts 1, 8. And uh, you might want to try to find those in your copy of God's Word because I'd like to read them together in unison tonight. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And then you can turn to Mark 16, 15. And then we'll go to Luke 24, 45 to 49. John chapter 20, 21 to 23. And then Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. So let's stand out of respect for God's word. And we will just read these. And we'll start with Matthew. And let's read it together. Read them together in unison. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. Saying it together. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things, Whatsoever commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Now let's turn to the Gospel of Mark. And as I've often said, this is, as it were, the shortest presentation of the Great Commission in the Gospels, but it is really to the point. Mark 16 and verse 15. Mark 16 and verse 15 Let's read it together. And he said unto them, Go to the kings of all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. Now, let's turn to Luke, chapter 24. The 24th chapter of Luke, and we will read verses 45 through 49. Luke, chapter 24, verses 45 through 49. There the word of God says, as, as we read it together. Then opened he their understanding, that they might understand the scriptures, and said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus did he who Christ to suffer, and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you are with and behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Then we go to the Gospel of John, chapter 20. John chapter 20, and as I've been emphasizing, this was not necessarily given in the same sequence as the other ones uh, that's recorded. The other ones that are recorded were given just as Christ was ascending up into heaven. This one was given somewhere between his resurrection and his ascension. But it stresses to us the concept, again, of the Great Commission. So let's read it together. John chapter 20, verses 21 through 23. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father has sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. I uh, mentioned this morning that uh, if you wanted some homework for next Sunday, I would be happy to give it to you. Do you remember what that homework was for next Sunday? It was to read the book of the Acts, and all the epistles. Remember that? So as to understand a little bit more about New Testament church truth. Has anybody started their assignment yet? Ah, okay, that's all right. Nobody, not many people volunteered to do it. But anyway, uh, I do have an assignment for you for next week. And that is to interpret verse 23 of Luke chapter 20 where it says, Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them, and whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. That's your assignment for next week. Mm. 
All right, we're hearing a lot of mmms, yeah. Then let's turn to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. Another very well-known uh, rendition of the Great Commission where Jesus said, and let's read it together, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria, Father, we thank you for these presentations of the Great Commission. I pray, dear Father, that you would teach it to us, that you would engraft it into our hearts, and that we, as your children, would obey it and do it. And now, Lord, continue to teach us as we continue to review this great biblical concept of the Great Commission. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Now, just to review a little bit uh, as, as what we've studied so far, we're asking a series of questions. And the first question that we ask is, what is the Great Commission? And we gave you the definition that is up on the screen, that the Great Commission is the divine command from the Lord Jesus Christ to evangelize the lost and is extended to all Christians and every local church to obey, to be actively involved with, and to endeavor to fulfill from the birth of the church in Acts chapter 2 until the redemption of the church in the rapture as described in 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And so I would encourage you to get that down because that's exactly what it is that Christ wants all of us to do. No individual or no church is exempt from that particular great commission. The second question that we dealt with was, when was the Great Commission given? Well, uh, we emphasized that it was given after the crucifixion of Christ, right before His resurrection. And in reality, the Great Commission represents the very last set of words that Jesus gave to His disciples before He ascended up into heaven. And keep in mind that the very last thing we usually say to people before we leave them for a period of time is what we think is very, very important. And so when Jesus, just before he ascended up into heaven, indicated that it was important for his disciples, for that which would become the church, to be involved in getting out the gospel and going into the entire world. And as I've said before, they really did a tremendous job. And they didn't have internet, they didn't have radio, they didn't have television, they didn't have the World Wide Web, but the book of Colossians teaches us that by the time the Colossians was written in maybe 30 years after the Great Commission was written, all the world had heard the gospel. That amazes me to consider that. But they were actively involved in doing what the Lord Jesus Christ wanted them to do. Well, the third question was, where is the commission, uh, Great Commission recorded? Obviously, we've just read there. Matthew 28, Mark 16, Luke 24, John 20, and Acts chapter 1. Last week, we dealt with the fourth question, which is, why was the Great Commission given? Why was the Great Commission given? And I gave you six things. To make Christ known to the lost, to preach the gospel to the world, to give people the opportunity to become saved, to reconcile the world to God, to reduce Satan's effect in the world, and to glorify God. And then we also looked at a fifth question last week, and that was this. How is the Great Commission to be fulfilled? And I shared with you it's to be fulfilled by a strong emphasis on evangelism and missions in the church. And again, I, I stated that there's a difference between evangelism and missions, though evangelism is involved with missions. Evangelism is taking the gospel to the lost so that they have the opportunity to hear about Jesus Christ and to be born again. Whereas missions goes beyond that. Missions is the uh, concept of evangelism, church planting, and discipleship. Evangelism, a missionary goes into a, an area 
and evangelizes. Then as individuals get saved, they disciple them so that they can grow in Christ. Then they establish a church in that area. That's what the Woodrings have done for many, many years, 28 years down in the DR. And uh, John is a, a fruit of their ministry. And right now, even as we speak, we know that Dan and Barb Woodring are down there in Dominican Republic. Uh, we know that Kevin and Trina Mayfield are doing that in Ecuador. How many churches have you folks established in Ecuador in your 20, 30 years? Five churches. We know that Elwood Fonmiller has been involved with that directly through Way of Truth Ministries. And we don't know how many churches that, that's been started. How many churches are in the five countries that we're in in Africa, for instance? Forty. Forty. And you see, that's just exactly what missions is all about. How about India? Quite a few. 20, 25 in India. You see, what, what does a missionary do? He goes into an area, he evangelizes, he disciples, and he plants a church. And that's what missions is all about. And each and every one of us as Christians have the responsibility to be actively and intentionally, intentionally involved. If we don't intentionally get involved with missions, we won't do it. We've got to determine in our hearts that we are going to give ourselves to evangelism, church planting, and discipleship by praying, giving, and even being willing to go. And I ended the message last week by saying that uh, uh, these three things are so important. Praying is the power of missions. Giving is the provision of missions. And going is the process of missions. And you may have written this down. I trust that you did. That where there is no prayer, there's no power. And where there is no giving, there is no providing. And where there is no going, there is no preaching. I want to turn with you to a couple of passages of Scripture before we go further to indicate how significant this is. Turn with me, if you will, please, to Romans chapter 10. Romans, the 10th chapter. Now, Ron uh, Longhofer, a bit ago, made reference to our missions conference. You, you want to put that on your schedule, the 12th through the 17th of April. And um, I just asked uh, John if he could be with us during that conference I don't know how this happened, but he opened up his, his phone. You know, everything's on your phone now. You don't just talk on it. You do everything else. He opened up his phone, and he has our missions conference in there. And I said, how'd you do that? I guess that's just divine leading or whatever. But he will be with us, as well as a num number of other missionaries. And our theme is going to be sent to the whosoever. Sent to the whosoever. And Romans chapter 10, verses 13 through 17, will be our key passage. Beginning with verse 13, it says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be Sent. We're going to stop there. Last week we went on and talked about the beautiful feet. But I'm going to stop there. How shall they preach except they be sent? There are over 200 nations in this world. Many of those nations do not have a strong gospel ministry. In some nations of the world, we find that people are backing off. I probably shared this with you before, and I know Kevin and I have talked about it, that, that there are some mission organizations that think that Ecuador is already evangelized. And yet, what is it, 2% have made decisions for Jesus Christ. I, I don't know, that must be common core math, that when 2% of the people are reached with the gospel, they're evangelized. I can't figure that one out. But people need to go into these nations of the world. 
And you see, it's our responsibility as the local church to send missionaries to the world. I thank the Lord for the opportunity that we've had to send various missionaries and people in ministry out into the world. But church, we can't quit. Our responsibility here is to do as they did in Acts chapter 13, to be involved in ministry and then thrust forth those who are involved in ministry out into the world to do the work of missions. Our responsibility as the church is to send people into the world to preach the gospel, to disciple, and to evangelize, uh, or, and to uh, plant churches. And so I want to say to you tonight, whether you are a young person, middle-aged, or older, have you ever considered going to the mission field? You see, if you are older and retired, you don't have to go out and raise $4,000 a month. Of course, maybe you don't make $4,000 a month either in your retirement. But the fact of the matter is, if you already have an income, you can spend that time on the mission field. It's important that we consider even short-term missions work. But you see, the local church has the responsibility to send. There are billions of people in the world tonight who need to hear the message of Christ. And if churches like ours don't send them, it says, how shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they've not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? Are you willing to go? Are you willing to say, Lord, here am I, send me? You see, it starts in the local church, missions does, and it starts in the heart of the individual responding to that. Now, the, the next question that I want to ask is, what if the Great Commission is not practiced? What if the Great Commission is not practiced? First of all, by the local church, and then secondly, by the individual Christian. Well, first of all, if the Great Commission is not practiced by the local church, there is going to be the loss of God's blessing in that church. I want you to get that down. I want you to underline it. I want you to believe it. I can share with you case after case after case after case after case where churches have reduced their missions budget and in the reduction of that missions budget, they lost blessing. I, I shared with you of the church that I know of down in Tampa uh, Bay area that wanted to build a new building. And in order to do that, they stopped supporting their missionaries for five years. They were going to pick up those missionaries after the church was built. Did they ever pick those missionaries up? No. You know why? The church no longer exists. When you start cutting missions, when you back off from missions in the local church, that is going to cause the loss of God's blessing to come into that local church. And I could give you many illustrations. I, and honestly, I don't understand it. I cannot figure out in my mind how a church or even a pastor would lead a church to cut missions in order to do something at home. Now, I realize that you have to have a strong home base. But what you don't cut is your own throat. Because you see, the preaching of the gospel and sending missionaries out into the world is what we're here for. That is the Great Commission. And we are all to be involved with it. And so the local church that does not practice the Great Commission will lose on God's blessing, but also will lack numerical growth. Because you see, as we read there in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, mission starts at home. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and into the uttermost part of the earth. And, and one of the reasons why we do what we can here, whether it's through door-to-door -door evangelism or uh, the, uh, the ice hockey uh, or the ice uh, 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 outreach we had last week or the other week, and, and uh, it was a great time up there at, uh, at uh, Galactic Ice. Uh, 
the reason why we do media, the reason why we get out the gospel is because we're commanded to do it. And when we do it here at home or send missionaries out to the world around us, that brings blessing and will bring numerical growth. But what about the individual? We can look at the local church and we can say, yes, it's a shame if the, if the local church does not get involved with a great commission that it will lose God's blessing and lack numerical uh, growth. But what about the individual? What about you? Hold your finger up in the air. Everybody hold your finger up in the air. Keep, keep it up there. Everybody, everybody, I'm going to wait till I see every finger up. All right. I'll go like this. Point it to your heart. Point it to yourself. What if you are not involved in the Great Commission? You. Me. What if I am not involved in the Great Commission? There are some devastating concerns. Simply because of the matter of fact, it, it, the matter of the fact, it is disobedience. It is disobeying God if you and I as individual Christians are not praying, giving, and going and involved personally with either supporting a missionary or being willing to go to the mission field or whatever the case. We are disobeying the word of God. There's a book that's been written recently entitled, um, 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 boy, I'm having a hard time tonight. It must be. Must be John here. Respectable sins. Respectable sins. I think one of the respectable sins, and by the way, there never is a respectable sin, but I think one of the respectable sins that could be listed is Christians not being willing to go to the mission field. That's a despicable sin. Finger up. Come on. Put it up again, please. What am I doing? What am I doing to fulfill the Great Commission? What if I don't? Three things briefly, and then we're finished for tonight. Number one, there's the loss of reward when we see Christ. Turn with me, if you would, please, to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And I don't have the time to elaborate upon these tonight, and I will not, but I will just bring them to your attention. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, and I would encourage you to read down through 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 is Paul's own testimony for ministry. Um, it's, it's a great chapter for uh, those in ministry, those in missions, those in the pastorate to read as it relates to attitude towards ministry. But in verses 19 and 20, Paul says this to the Thessalonians, For what is our hope? or joy, or crown of rejoicing. Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at His coming, for ye are our glory and joy. You see, Paul was used, Paul and Silas and Timothy, were used of the Spirit of God to evangelize and establish a church there at Thessalonica. And Paul was saying, when we get to heaven, you'll be there. And because you Thessalonians and others will be there, we will receive a, a crown of rejoicing. That's the soul winner's crown. That's the crown that would be given to the missionary who's faithful. And if we are not, therefore, actively involved in the Great Commission, that crown will be lost. I think it's great tonight that we have Ben Woodring here, planted a church, and John Rodriguez got saved through that church. Think about that. That's fruit, Ben. You, uh, you'll have a crown when you get to heaven. And that'll help your head as I see it there tonight. <laughs> no, but you understand, there will be blessing. What about you? Do you have a crown in heaven waiting for you because you are involved in missions, in the Great Commission? There will be the loss of reward, if not. Secondly, there will be an accountability given to God. If you are not involved in the Great Commission, you'll stand before God to give an account. Uh, go with me, please, to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 
2 Corinthians chapter 5, and what you see on the screen is a wrong passage of Scripture. But go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and notice, if you would please, verses 9 through 11. And all these verses will preach, but I'm not going to preach them tonight, but look at it. 2 Corinthians 5, 9 says, Wherefore we labor, that whether present or absent, we might be accepted of Him. That's not working our way into to heaven. That's not working our way into salvation. That is making certain that we are serving the Lord, so that we will hear Him say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Then he says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. The judgment seat of Christ is where we will receive reward for faithful service unto God. If we have not been actively involved in missions, particularly, we will give an account to God and we will lose that reward. That's why he goes on in verse 11 and says a very serious thing. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest unto God and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. When you stand before the Lord and give an account, Will you hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant, partly because you've been involved in the great commission of praying and giving and going? Will you? What have you done in missions in your life? What mission field have you visited in your life? What missionary do you currently financially support? What missionary do you write to? What missionary have you had in your home? This is all part of what the Great Commission is. And if we don't do it, there will be the loss of reward. There will be an accountability to God. And there's one more thing. We will delay the rapture. Jimmy D. Young preached this, if you recall, back in this past uh, summer at the Bible conference. We all are saying, oh, Lord, I want you to return. But, you know, there's something that God wants us to do to enhance that, as it were. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 9. 2 Cor- I'm sorry, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. Look at it. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness. That's talking about the coming of Christ. The context is the, is the second coming of Christ. And it says, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to, to who? Usward. Believers. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God has promised that Jesus will come again. Christ promised that. He said, I will come quickly. And that word quickly doesn't mean in a short period of time. It it means that when, when the happenings of the second coming of Christ begin, it'll be rapid fire, very quickly, rapid fire. But he said here, that the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us. You see, the Lord is waiting for us to get involved in the Great Commission. Number one, so that perhaps the rapture can be enhanced, but number two, so that when we stand before the Lord, we'll hear those words Well done, thou good and faithful servant. What are you doing? What are you doing? Put your finger up. Everybody, come on. What am I doing to enhance the Great Commission? What am I doing to enhance the Great Commission? We're all to be involved, whether it's praying, giving, or going. How are we doing? 
The Lord willing, next Sunday night we'll, we'll wrap up this study in the Great Commission. But between now and then, truly, I would encourage you to take some time and to read those passages of Scripture that we read tonight on the Great Commission and ask yourself the question, what am I doing to participate in and to enhance the Great Commission? It's your responsibility. It's my responsibility, not just to be a part of a local church that does it, but to be personally involved with praying and giving and going. What are you doing? Finger up, what am I doing? You'll give an account, and so will I, for our involvement in reaching the world for Christ. Let's be honest with ourselves and honest with God in asking the question, what are we doing? Praise the Lord for those of you who are really actively involved, who are praying for missionaries, supporting missionaries personally, inviting them into your home, going to visit them. Praise God for that. If you're not doing that, you are even on earth missing out on the blessing, as well as when you stand before the Lord. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to what? Every creature. Let's do it. Stand for prayer. Father in heaven, as we come to you this evening, we do thank you and praise you once again for the great opportunity that we've had just to study your word tonight. Lord, I thank you that we have four sets of missionaries with us tonight. The Mayfields, the Woodrings, the Fawn Millers, Rodriguez, it's just like a breath of fresh air to have missionaries in a church service. It just is so refreshing. I, I think we've been blessed tonight just because of their presence. And I pray for every one of them, each one of them, that you'll continue to use them. But I pray for us, those who are not in full-time vocational mission work. I would pray, Lord, send us into the field of harvest. Send us. And I pray, dear Lord, that everyone under the sound of my voice tonight, rather, whether in this service or, or following us on the broadcast, I pray, Lord, that everyone will be willing to say, Lord, here am I. Send me. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity that we've had to be here tonight. And Thank you again for the Rodriguez family, and I pray for the children that, that they'll get feeling better for Juan and Jose and Joel, and, and even pray for Vanessa as she takes care of them. I pray that you'll provide for them. Physically, I pray that that next $3,400 that they need per month will soon be raised. I pray that the next time we see them, we'll hear that that's been up to quite a bit. Now, Lord, I ask that you'll dismiss us with your blessing. And, uh, Lord, uh, we'll thank you for that. For it's in Jesus' name I pray.